first of all, thank you very much to the Academy, uh, to the Friars. Uh, I deeply appreciate my close relationship uh, both with the Academy and with the Franciscan Order. It has brought only richness to my life. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, I'm so very pleased to be here with you. Uh, when I was informed of this opportunity, I was racking my brains about what I could possibly talk about. Uh, and then it, it became very clear I needed to talk about clearly something Franciscan, uh, but probably not just something Franciscan. What I'm going to be talking about tonight is a document which I discovered uh, among the various papers of the Academy of American Franciscan History when I became the director back in uh, 1993. It hardly seems like it could be that long ago. Uh, and so what I'm going to be talking to you about is something that is very deeply Franciscan, and I, and I think you will all see uh, how Franciscan it is. But at the same time, it tells us an awful lot uh, about colonial Mexico, uh, and it also tells you about the place that colonial Mexico had uh, in the larger Catholic world. And so I'm going to be talking about Fray Agustin de Betancourt and the Via Crucis in Nahuatl. Now, Fray Agustin is one of the better known Franciscans from colonial Mexico. His reputation largely comes from his fame as a historian. Uh, he wrote the monumental Teatro Mexicano, which is a four volume history uh, of the Franciscan order in Mexico, mostly of the Holy Gospel province. Uh, in addition to his renown as a historian, however, he was a very well-known scholar of Nahuatl, the Aztec language, and he published several works in Nahuatl as well. This talk is going to pre take a, a preliminary look at both the life and times of Betancourt and also focus specifically on a very small work written by him in Nahuatl, which is a guide for the celebration of the Stations of the Cross which is celebrated throughout the world, but uh, throughout the year, but especially on Good Friday. The brief detail of Fray Agustin's life are relatively simple. He was born in Mexico sometime around 1620. He attended the University of Mexico and received his baccalaureate degree there. From the university, he entered the Franciscan monastery in Puebla, where he eventually took his vows as a friar. He remained in Puebla for several years, teaching novices in the Franciscan house there. His specialties were humane letters and Nahuatl. Eventually, he was assigned as a priest in the Franciscan parish of San Jose de los Naturales, which is the major native parish in Mexico City. There he lived and served for 40 years. In 1642, he was appointed the lector of arts within the province, and on various occasions, he served uh, on the definitorium uh, of the Holy Gospel province. Uh, he eventually became the official chronicler of the province, uh, who was, and interestingly enough, he was appointed by the Comisario General of the order, uh, and his appointment as chronicler was confirmed by Pope Innocent XI. So this is, this is a pretty big deal. In that position, he was able to draw upon the significant historical archive of the order. Uh, and he also, at the same time, served as a professor of theology within the order. Uh, he was an official preacher for the order. And he supervised works that were published by friars, especially in Nahuatl, within uh, the province. He died in 1700. Now, several of his publications stand as truly significant. The first of these, for my purposes, was the Arte de la Lengua Mexicana, a grammar of Nahuatl, which was based on principles laid down by the famous Latin grammarian Ampoldo Nebrija. His, this first work appeared in 1673, and it was published in Mexico. In the next year, he published a handbook for the administration of the sacraments in Spanish, Manuel para administrar los sac santos sacramentos. And this book draws on two earlier handbooks, uh, both by Franciscans. It would become, however, one of the most popular works uh, written by Betancourt, and it went through three, if not four, different editions uh, during his lifetime. 
It was a big book, about 150 pages long. Now, Betancourt's skills as a historian are seen in a 1682 imprint, a brief biography of St. Anthony of Padua, clearly one of the most revered of the Franciscan saints. It's curious that Betancourt does refer to Anthony as a Spaniard, a little bit of nationalism on his part. Uh, however, as we all know, Anthony was Portuguese uh, and gained his fame in Padua. Betancourt continued his writing on topics of interest to the Franciscans in 1697 when he published a biography of the founder of the order, St. Francis of Assisi. His Teatro Mexicano was first published in pieces. The first piece came out in 1697, which was the chronicle of the Holy Gospel province. The fourth section of this larger work, uh, which was uh, biographies of the friars who had been members of the province, uh, were published uh, the next year in 1698, the Menologia. Uh, Ultimately, the four volumes of the Teatro Mexicano is one of the largest books published in colonial Mexico. It consists of four volumes and a total of 1,815 pages plus introductory and conclusion material. Uh, having published a couple of books, I know that's a lot of work. It covers the history from the conquest and settlement some of the Iberian precursors, descriptions and histories of each of the dioceses of the region, cities, important historical information. Now, much of Betancourt's reputation for scholarship comes from his study of Nahuatl. By the late 17th century, the number of works published in that language had begun to decline significantly, far, far fewer than in the 16th century. But because of his prolific career as a writer and a chronicler, we actually happen to know more about Betancourt's publications than many of his contemporaries. Uh, he also left several manuscripts uh, that were not published, and so we also have records of those. Now, in comparing the lists of Betancourt's works as he reported them himself in the Teatro Mexicano, and the imprints of which we have copies in various libraries around the world, there are some noticeable gaps. There are books that he says he printed of which copies simply do not remain. One of these was, in his words, El Via Crucis en Mexicano dos veces impreso. Well, that means a Via Crucis in Nahuatl, the Aztec language, which was published two times. We don't have any copies of it at all. Nevertheless, we've never been able to find a copy here in the United States, in Mexico, Spain, Chile. The work, however, was clearly popular. It was printed twice before his death in 1700. Some of the guides to early printing even have a description of the work saying that it consisted of 11 leaves. Now, within the manuscript collection of the Academy of American Franciscan History, there is a piece with the title, Para Saber Andar Las Estaciones de la Via Sacra y Las Indulgencias Que Ganan, which in English is, in order to know how to walk the stations of the Holy Way and the indulgences which one gains. Now, the theme of that work sounds pretty similar. And the date, well, the manuscript says it was written by Betancourt, and it carries a date of 1680. Both of those correspond fairly closely to what we know from Betancourt's own testimony. Upon further examination, when you actually look at the manuscript, it has an internal date of 1738, and it was copied by a person, Mateo de San Juan Chicahuasla. So from this information, it's fair to conclude that the manuscript which the Academy holds is in fact a manuscript copy of a book that was published by Betancourt. Somebody had the book and they copied it out longhand. Now it's of octavo size, that's about 16 centimeters by 22 centimeters, and, it has, and it's 28 leaves long. This happens to be the frontispiece. 
The paper is European. It has some pages that are fairly badly worm-eaten, uh, which, of course, makes it much more difficult to understand what's going on. The handwriting can be characterized as unsophisticated. I think you can see that here. It's a far cry from some of the elegant hands of Mexico City. And along with the inscription, it, believed, it, it makes me think that the person who wrote it was not really a trained scribe. Now, the most engaging feature of the work are the illustrations that are found throughout. Now, it's unfortunate that we don't have a printed copy of the book in order to determine whether or not the illustrations we see in this manuscript have anything at all to do with actual illustrations in the book. The manuscript copy consists of an introduction, the 14 stations of the cross, and some final material, including an act of contrition in Nahuatl. In this regard, it doesn't really vary much from the common format for handbooks of the Via Crucis, which include meditations and prayers at each of the 14 stations. Now, these are the traditional 14 stations. Christ condemned, receives the cross, the fall, meets the Blessed Mother, Simon of Cyrene, face wiped by Veronica, second fall, the women of Jerusalem, third fall, stripped of his garments, crucifixion, death on the cross, the body's taken down from the cross, and he's laid in the tomb. Now, the devotion of the Stations of the Cross begins in the early Middle Ages. From earliest times, pilgrims to Jerusalem would trace the route taken by Jesus on Good Friday. As early as 1342, the Franciscans gained a set of indulgences for those who visited these special places in recognition of their guardianship of the city. We are, after all, in the monastery of the Holy Land. <clears throat> By the sixth century, some European churches had constructed chapels to represent stops along Christ's passion. In 1520, the Pope granted a set of indulgences to the faithful who visited a specific set of the stations in the Franciscan convent in Antwerp. Now, by the 17th century, the devotion of the stations had become fairly common in the Western Church, and the number of stations had regularized around the 14. Finally, in 1686, Pope Innocent XI granted to the Franciscan order the right to place stations in their churches. And moreover, those Franciscans and those persons who were affiliated with the order, first, second, first order, second order, third order Franciscans, might gain indulgences by visiting the stations. And in fact, the indulgences granted were the same as the indulgences granted to individuals who made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem itself. This privilege was confirmed in 1694 and in 1726, it was extended to all the faithful. So it was no longer a Franciscan monopoly. It became universal in the Western Church. At last, in 1731, Pope Clement XII extended the privilege to all churches as long as they were created with Franciscan assistance, in quotes, and with the approval of the local bishop. Consequently, the appearance of the Betancourt via Crucis in 1680 fits very well into the development of this particular uh, devotion, especially as part of the Franciscan order and leading up to the uh, ultimate definitive approval by the Pope. It also explains the popularity of this particular publication since it went through two printings before 1700. So within the course of 20 years, it was published at least twice, which for colonial Mexico is a very hot seller, just to let you know. <laughs> now, the devotion of the Stations of the Cross since the 17th century has consisted of a general introduction to Christ's passion. Each of the stations is commemorated with a short meditation, a litany of intercessions between the celebrant and the faithful, and then concludes with a series of standard prayers, such as an act of contrition, Lord's Prayer, the Hail Mary, the doxology. Also included in the litany are the ancient prayer, the Stabat Mater, 
and other canticles of Mary. The academy version of the Betancourt handbook follows this pattern rather closely. The introductory material consists of a rather long sermon or a series of admonitions, which in Nahuatl is a tenonotztlalistli, which goes on for almost 12 pages, a very long introduction. There is a brief description, introduction to the Stations of the Cross, and then each station has a meditation or an admonition, followed by a series of responses. As a result, the text for each of these stations occupies between three and four pages. And then at the very end, as I said before, is a Nahuatl version of the Act of Contrition. The Academy version has the 14 stations, but one of the unique features of the Academy manuscript is that it is illustrated with seemingly unsophisticated drawings. They, they look like sketches. They don't have the clarity of line or control that one would expect from a trained artist. Nonetheless, the drawings convey a great deal of information beyond what is actually found in the text. And it also manifests, they manifest a very high degree of iconographical information and sophistication. Now, not all of the 14 stations of the crosses are illustrated. The illustrations in the Academy manuscript consist of the title page, which we have seen, the drawing of Christ carrying the cross to Calvary, the first station, Christ fallen carrying the cross, the seventh station, a second Christ carrying the cross, the eighth station, a second Christ falling, the ninth station, Christ stripped of his garments on the tenth station, the crucifixion lying down as opposed to the cross being raised, the pieta, that is when his body is taken from the cross, the thirteenth station, along with symbols of the passion, and the interment, station fourteen. And then at the very end, there is a, what I call a, a flowered cross. Now, in addition to these larger illustrations, there are also several designs, drawings at chapter headings or as text separators. All in all, the illustrations convey the sense that this is a popularized version of Betancourt's work. It's illustrated to a popular taste rather than with European engravings and woodcuts that one would normally find. Unfortunately, again, we don't have a printed copy, so we can't compare these with what might have been. It's interesting that nearly all of the illustrations depict events in the second half of the devotion. Furthermore, the one event that serves as the culmination, that is the passion on the cross, is absent. Some of the other famous moments in the way of the Passion, such as Veronica wiping Christ's face, or the meeting with the Blessed Virgin, or when Simon the Cyrene takes up the cross, they are not illustrated. Yet a less picturesque moment, such as the second falling, is depicted. In the drawing for Station 8, as you saw, when Christ meets the women of Jerusalem, we only see Christ. We don't see the women of Jerusalem. Now, the images in the illustrations demand some greater attention. One of the features that one sees in nearly all of the scenes prior to the crucifixion is the rope around Christ's neck, the crown of thorns, and the cross itself. The manner in which these elements are depicted do not vary considerably from one image to another. Both the rope and the cross carry additional decorative dots or lines along their surface, as you can see here. In the case of the rope, these dots almost lead one to believe that Christ is carrying a rosary rather than the rope of the passion. The dots in this context, however, give texture to the surface, although they're actually represented on one side. Now, in the case of the cross, the dots are less representational and more decorative. And as you can see, at least in one for number eight, the illustrations are 
actually lines, which probably intend to show the graining of the wood. Now, Christ also bears a crown of thorns, which you can see, one of the most important signs of the Passion. But if one looks closely, one can see that the crown of thorns has a starburst pad pattern. You can see there, 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 and there, there, there. Paul Kellerman, in his work on the Broke, has identified these as the tres potencias, the three powers. These are rays of light, or tongues of fire, added to the nimbus, or halo. Originally, it symbolized the Greek cross within the halo, but by the Baroque, the cruciform had been lost, and only the three frontmost parts remained. These powers became associated among the Spanish mystics with the three faculties of the soul, memory, understanding, and will. And they are frequently seen on Baroque statues of Christ, especially such as those used in Holy Week processions, uh, these from Seville, the other place that I like to live. One should notice that the Baroque figures of Christ also have the rope around the neck, very similar to what we just saw in the other illustrations. Now, the illustrations for chapters 11 and 13 are particularly important in that they depict the collection of symbols of the passion. These include the nails, the hammer, lance, sponge, tongs, ladder, winding cloth or robe, crown of thorns, dice and rooster, among other things. In the illustration of the crucifixion on your left, one sees the implements used, the hammer, nails, tongs, and the rope from the way of the cross. In the deposition on your right, a somewhat larger repertoire of symbols is, is present since the lance is also depicted along with the hammer and the nails. Now the revel relevance of these is, is quite obvious. The tongs, uh, perhaps less obvious, were used to hold the nails while they were hammered. The lance was used to pierce his side. The sponge, which is not depicted here, was used to offer the bitter wine. The dice and the rooster, not depicted here, but are also taken from gospel accounts. The dice were used by the soldiers as they cast lots for Jesus' robe, while the rooster or cock symbolizes Peter's threefold denial. All of these symbols were frequently used in the 16th century for atrium crosses as representations of the, of, of the Passion. Uh, this happens to be uh, from Wichapan. Uh, if you ever buy a copy of my book, uh, The History of the Catholic Church in Latin America, I have a similar picture uh, of the atrium cross from Akolman uh, that also shows the symbols of the Passion. Now, at the base of the cross, in stations 13 and 14, one sees this little face. Now, it's actually not just a face, as you can see in the one on your right. It really is a skull and crossbones. And it is frequently used in conjunction with the crucifixion. Now, according to the pious legend, Golgotha, or Calvary, means hill of the skull. The particular skull referred to is the skull of Adam. Supposedly, Adam, the first man, was buried on that site. Thus, in many medieval illustrations, and as my wife will vouch, whenever we go to an art museum now and I see a medieval illustration of the crucifixion, I will take a picture because you'll see a little skull and crossbones at the bottom of the cross. Now, the symbolism is clearly that Christ is the new Adam. But one should also notice that at the beginning and at the end of many of the sections, there's also a small cross coming out of a circle, not unlike an orb. Let's see, here we can see on our left, it looks like that. Perhaps the most interesting of these is the one found in uh, section six, which is the one you see here, which seems very, very similar uh, to a Maya glyph. Uh, as you can see over here on the right. Uh, and many of these skull and crossbones look ever so much uh, like a, a, a Maya glyph. Unfortunately, we've got hundreds of miles of separation uh, and different cultures. 
Now, two of the most complex illustrations are the title page and the interment. The title page shows two angelic figures, you can see them here, holding up either end of a stone arch upon which rests the three crosses of Calvary. All three crosses have the chi or X figure on them. You can see it clearly on the second one. If you look very closely, you can see it on the two sides. The, the Christ, Christ cross is further decorated with five flowers, uh, which are interestingly arranged, one in the middle, three below, and one on his left. We should contrast that with the flowered cross, which was seen uh, at the very end of the handbook, where we have flowers on top, on the sides, and on the base, only four. So this is the title page with a rather interesting five, and this is the, the flowered cross at the end. Uh, traditionally, however, we know that there were five wounds which are frequently represented as flowers, perhaps from a Spanish expression, expression flor de la sangre, meaning a wound. The traditional five wounds correspond to the two hands, the two feet, and the side where Christ was injured in the crucifixion. Of course, this becomes the coat of arms of Holy Gospel province of the Franciscans uh, to which Betancourt uh, pertained. And here we see the stylistic representation uh, of the five wounds in the uh, uh, emblem of the, of the province over here on your left. Now, on the title page, under the cross, there's an image of the chalice uh, and the host surrounded by a halo or nimbus. It's a juxtaposition of the passion with the Eucharist, and this is a fairly common aspect of Baroque art. This juxtaposition can also be seen in another atrium cross, the one that we chop on, which is actually the one we just saw before, uh, where we see the, the, the Eucharist represented along with the symbols of the Passion. And if we also think of that archway that the two angels were holding over here on the left, we find a very, very similar kind of archway uh, at the village of Tlahuelilpa uh, in the province of Tula uh, in Mexico. Uh, and this happens to be a, a Franciscan church, just in case you were interested. Now, the illustration of the burial of Christ is unique. Rather than a cave burial, as mentioned in the Bible, the artist has Christ represented in an ornate coffin, which you can see here on your left. These coffins, often with glass or crystal sides, are found throughout Mexico uh, and usually hold uh, sculptures of the very Christ, although saints are also frequently depicted this way. In the representations, you can see bruises on, on, on Christ's cheek, wounds on the feet. Now, it's not clear in the illustration here whether or not Christ still wears the crown of thorns, but the coffin certainly is ornately decorated with stars and other symbols and topped by a canopy, very similar to a crystal coffin as one might find in a 16th century parish church. Now, the illustrations of the Academy manuscript give us a great deal of information that the viewer can receive beyond the material just on the written page. On the one hand, they firmly place the work in the Baroque period, yet they still manifest many medieval symbols. It's in the realm of symbolism and iconography in general where the illustrations demonstrate a fairly high level of sophistication. While they may merely have been illustrations copied from paintings or sculptures known to the artist, they are accurate and effective in conveying a significant level of meaning beyond the text. Now, the text, as noted earlier, follows the example of many Spanish language stations of the cross of the same era. Indeed, part of the Nahuatl must have been a translation of a Spanish text, although some of the material seems to have been written specifically for Nahuatl speakers, since it is quite different from anything seen in a Spanish text. 
Since the papal recognition of the Stations of the Cross as a formal devotion and the extension of its indulgences dates to the end of the 17th, beginning of the 18th century. One finds that there are similar handbooks published in Spanish at about the same time. One early version appeared in 1705, printed in Madrid, with a Mexican version appearing in Puebla in 1729. It is entitled Manuel de los, de los Ejercicios para los Agravios de Cristo by a Franciscan Diego de Oviedo. Just a couple of, of moments. Uh, I think the good Lord has a great sense of humor. This is my book. I bought this book back in 1976 at the flea market in Mexico City at Lagunilla for about five bucks. And I thought it was a, it was a, it was a vellum bound colonial book. I thought that'd be cool to have. And so I bought it and of course, 40 years later, I open it up and I say, geez, it's the Stations of the Cross in Spanish. And it's one of the earliest editions of the Stations of the Cross published in Mexico. So I've been carrying this around now for the last 40 years and, and I'm gonna use it. it. By the way, it's a little, it's a little tiny book. Now, as noted, the devotions for each station include both prayers and additional material of a devotional nature, like meditations or uh, admonitions. The text of these pieces is unique in the Nahuatl version, differing significantly from the Spanish. But the Spanish and the Nahuatl homilies do have some things in common. Each of the meditations begins with a description of the place, and frequently it says how many steps it is from the previous station. And then you have a meditation. The descriptions are very similar, however, the Nahuatl and the Spanish. For the fourth station, for example, the Spanish reads, this is the fourth station, which consists of 61 steps that to there the Lord walked, and it is the place where his majesty met his sorrowful mother. The Nahuatl version reads very, very similarly. Here is the fourth place of kneeling called a station. Our beloved savior was walking around. It was 70 steps, a slightly different number. This is where his weeping mother, St. Mary, and her afflicted beloved son recognized themselves, that is one another, on the road and met face to face. Now, we have some slight difference in the number of steps, but other than that, it's, it's really quite similar. Now, the number of steps between the stations is largely consistent between Nahuatl and Spanish version. The discrepancies appear in the second, fourth, sixth, and ninth stations. In these instances, the difference seems to result in the Nahuatl author's inability to convert from Spanish numbers, which is a decimal system, into Nahuatl numbers, which is a vigesimal system. It's base 20. So he was doing the math in his head and he got it wrong several times. So in one instance for the sixth station, the Spanish gives the distance as 191 steps. The Nahuatl simply gives 91, accidentally dropping the 100. In the ninth station, this, in Spanish, the distance was 71 steps, but in Nahuatl, it's 140, so somehow he doubled it. One might posit that the copyist recognized the seven in the tens place, but accidentally took it as a multiplier for twenties. So one can, one can piece together the math that he was doing in his head, and he just got it wrong sometimes. Lastly, in Nahuatl, there are no distances listed for the 13th and 14th stations, while in Spanish, they're, they're nominal distances of 25 and 30 paces each. <clears throat> now, the actual meditations in Nahuatl differ significantly from those in Spanish. In the example of the fourth station, again, the Nahuatl offers a very simple description of the mother and son meeting on the road, looking at one another with love. Darkness fell, as did affliction upon her heart. She did not wipe his face, but followed him weeping all the way to Calvary. That's the gist of the Nahuatl. In Spanish, however, the meditation draws a parallel between the sufferings of Christ and the sufferings of Mary. Then, as with all of the other meditations, the Spanish provides a 10-line poem 
to summarize the meeting. These poems are absent in the Nawak. Now, the most interesting comparisons can be made between the prayers in Nawak and the prayers in Spanish, since these are features that became standardized across all versions, regardless of language. Uh, and I will tell you, I've looked at a lot of Stations of the Cross, both Catholic, Episcopal, Lutheran, Orthodox, and what's interesting is that many of these prayers uh, both get translated in language and also uh, from branches of the Christian church rather intact. They, they don't vary a whole lot. So to see the slightly different message imparted in Spanish versus in Nahuatl, you can begin to look at prayers for specific stations. In the case of the second station, when Jesus takes up his cross, the standard prayer in Spanish condemns the Jews for tormenting Jesus and then compares Jesus taking up the cross to Isaac carrying his own wood for his immolation. It ends with the hope that the penitent might take up the metaphorical cross of his own penance in recognition of his own sins. The Nawat version offers a unique take on the prayer. Rather than just blaming the Jews for Jesus' punishment, the Nawat version calls the Jews scoundrels. Tlawililoke, Dios me in Nawat. The Nawat version then also describes Jesus as being loaded up with crossed sticks of wood. Quao. Nepanoli. The Nahuatl text then describes the cross using the Spanish borrow word of cruz. So it first uses a Nahuatl word for cross pieces of wood, and then it uses the Spanish word cruz. While the standard version of the prayer compares Jesus to Isaac, Nahuatl makes no reference to that at all. But those of us who've studied a lot of Nahuatl, and especially the, the early period, there's a great sensitivity about the sacrifice of Isaac because for two things. One, they, the early friars used it as an admonition against human sacrifice, but they were also very worried that it might be seen as somehow endorsing human sacrifice. So there was a real tension uh, about the Abraham and Isaac story. So in the prayer for the sixth station, when Veronica wipes Jesus' face, there's also a large divergence between the wording of the Spanish and, and the Nahuatl. Although the station is identified with Veronica, the traditional prayer in Spanish does not mention her by name, but rather calls her that pious woman. By contrast, the Nahuatl calls her the noble or honored woman, the Tziwatzintli, Veronica, and it actually uses her name. In contrast, the prayer for the eighth station, when Jesus confronts the women of Jerusalem, the Nawat version of the prayer makes no mention of the women at all, although they are discussed in the, in, in the introduction. In Spanish, the prayer says that as Jesus taught the women of Jerusalem, as they cried for themselves while commiserating with Jesus, the penitent might gain true contrition through tears. Now, the Nahuatl is even more convoluted. It maintains the image of washing one's sins away through tears of contrition, but adds the typically Nahuatl image of an impure soul. I have blackened and dirtied my soul, which is a very common Nahuatl expression, or at least it became a common Nahuatl expression for sin. Toward the end of the work, there's also a long section, this is one of my favorites, in which the author describes all of the punishments meted out on Jesus and all of his sufferings in the Passion. After the 14th station in Spanish, there's a litany of short meditations focusing on the sufferings of Christ, and it begins for the agony and imprisonment of the Lord, with a response being blessed and praised be forever, O great Lord. Following that, the participants recall the blows and injuries, the false testimonies, whippings, blasphemies, and other sufferings of Christ, with the same response after it, blessed and praised be forever, O great Lord. <coughs> this litany is no longer a standard part uh, of the devotion of the Stations of the Cross. There are, however, similar, similar litanies circulating. Again, uh, thank heavens for the internet. Uh, and I found several that are called Litany of the Passion. And again, several websites and also several different uh, branches of the church. 
Now, a rather unique version of this litany appears in the Nawat translation, and it describes all of the affronts to Jesus in terms of very large numbers, using what can only be described as a variant of the traditional Nawat numbering system. Each of the sufferings is described in exquisite detail. 144 kicks, 120 times they stoned him, 102 slaps in the face, 28 times they struck his chest with stones, 80 times they mistreated him, 77 times they whipped his necks, 350 times on a stone base, 70 times on a stone column, 4,800 times they tore his precious body with a whip, and other fantastical numbers include 130,000 times he paid for our sins with his blood, 1,000 dripping tears, and 5,065 flayings, 362,400 drops of blood. Wow. Now, to understand how unique this section is, one needs to know a little bit about Nawat and the Nawat numbering system. The Nawa, like Mesoamerican groups, used a base 20 number system. It, they were vigesimal, unlike the decimal system that we use. Now, for so we count by integers, tens, hundreds, thousands. So they go by integers, twenties, four hundreds, eight thousands, sixteen thousands. So for example, we say 100, which is one in the hundreds place. Well, they would, for that same number, they would say five twenties. Okay, so you've got a five in the twenties place. This is the new math, guys, just in case you wanted to know. So, in English, in general, we don't use a number higher than nine in any one of the places. So we say 900. We don't normally say 1000. I mean, nowadays, yeah, we say 1923, meaning 1923. But those, that, that's in popular speech. We don't normally use a, a, a number larger than nine in any one of the places. And so in Nahuatl, similar, you don't use a number larger than 20 in any one of the places. Yet in these fantastical numbers, the author has been very created and violated those basic rules of numbers. The best example of the violation of this rule can be found in the number, and I will translate it, two twenties and fifteen eight thousands. So that would be the equivalent of thirty-eight eight thousands, and three twenties four hundreds, and three twenties. Well, it, it, it just doesn't work because they don't line up. You can't have a number bigger than 19 in any one of those categories. So the explanation for this is I've come up with two kind of possibilities. On the one hand, the author was attempting to give the impression of really huge numbers to talk about the sufferings and indignities that Christ had to confront during his passion. And in, in, a, in a similar way that we might say something like a gazillion or 117,000, he made up numbers that sounded really, really big, very large. Secondly, to this day in Nahuatl speaking groups, one sign of your command of the language is the ability to express large numbers. So this is taken as a point of erudition that you can come up with these big numbers. Unfortunately, in his case, they happen to be completely fictional. But, you know, what can I say? And so in the example of the Via Crucis, all I can think is that the Nahuatl author, and in this case, I cannot believe that it was Betancourt, got carried away in expressing large numbers, and he simply began to make up big ones, even though they didn't fit with the actual number system. Now, I'm really just getting started with this one. It's, it's, it's again, like an onion or the nesting Russian dolls. Every time I look at it, another layer comes forth, and my wife knows what this is like, because the last two books have been that way. But I have, I, identified at least three issues that are of critical importance. One 
is the development of the devotion of the Stations of the Cross within the Catholic Church is central to understanding what's going on here. And what's remarkable about this Nawat version of the devotion is that it appears so very close to the approval of the litany by the papacy. And it's spread throughout the Western church. And so the colony of New Spain, Mexico, can be seen as active in an issue of great interest and of great modernity, if you will, within the worldwide church, if not actually on the very cutting edge. Secondly, the manuscript is profusely illustrated. Again, it demonstrates that the, that the illustrator was fully cognizant of the themes and issues of the church at large. Although the illustrations seem to be naive, if not even quixotic, in fact, they manifest a solid command of Spanish symbolism. He was a pretty good iconographer. He knew what was going on, and we get an awful lot of additional information out of the illustrations themselves. And then lastly, while the Nahuatl text generally follows the lead of similar Spanish texts of the time, it is unique and it clearly addresses some of the issues within the native community and in a manner which was in keeping with the interests and sensibilities of that audience. Thus, while the Nahuatl version of the Via Crucis seems to be an odd little book from an isolated community, it actually addresses both issues within the larger church and in a manner that is very well integrated into the specific audience to which it was delivered. Thank you very much. <laughs>